There's an old hymn, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And grace is a great subject. The Bible says a lot about grace. Today I want to talk about grace on this edition of Theology Thursday. But I don't want to talk about grace that saves us. I don't want to talk about grace that takes care of all of my sin. Uh, theologians have traditionally divided the grace of God in two broad categories, common grace and saving grace. And they're just what they sound like. So saving grace is the grace exhibited by God that accomplishes our forgiveness, our salvation. Common grace, on the other hand, is just a general grace that's given to all humanity, um, irrespective of their religion or no religion, uh, their behavior. It's just God's general common grace. And so I just want to talk about that common grace today to remind us that God is not just good in giving us grace in order to be saved and go to heaven and be forgiven and all of that, but that God also is just a good and gracious God and that he has uh, given grace into our world. And so this common grace, there are at least five areas, uh, even in Scripture, where we see the common grace of God. And so I just want to kind of walk through those uh, for a minute. So the first one will be in creation. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 44, uh, 45. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And God sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so what we find here is that, you know, there are people who are bad, but they still have food. So God, in just using in creation, you know, the rain, the food, uh, the beauty that we see, uh, the crisp fall mornings, the, well, where I live, we don't have warm summers. We have blistering hot summers. Uh, but the, the beauty of the blossoming in the spring and the sounds and smells and all those things uh, that God gives to everyone, um, not just, to, the, uh, not just uh, to his people. The next one I want to look at is Romans 1, 18 and 20. And this is the intellect. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness by, of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now this one, um, when I say the intellect, what I mean is that People can use their mind and see that there's a God. They can see that there's creation. They can see how complex and complicated the DNA is. But God has, by his common grace, given people a mind to use and to think. And it's not just believers um, who are the ones who are going to use their minds. Okay? So a third uh, area that we see is Romans 2, 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Now this one uh, tells us that there's a law on the heart of human beings. There is a morality that people inherently have. I mean, every culture pretty much believes that murder is wrong. Every culture has uh, a moral sense when it comes to marriage, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, ethical things like you don't steal, uh, you know, you, you don't lie. There are, there's a, a moral sense that God has given to everyone uh, because if there were not this kind of natural moral sense, we would have complete, total, absolute anarchy uh, everywhere. And so God, by his common grace, gives a sense of morality uh, and the law to everyone. Okay. Next, we find Genesis 4, 17 to 22. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahuchel, and Mahuchel fathered Methushel, and Methushel fathered Lamech. 
And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other is Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of instruments of bronze and iron. Now, the reason I select this verse is particularly because of Jubal, who is the father of all those that play instruments. In other words, the arts are part of God's common grace. Not every great work of art has been produced by Christians. Many non-Christians have produced great music. They produce great artwork, great sculptures, great architecture, um, you know, all these things. So that's a part of God's common grace that he has given us the arts to make life more pleasant and to make my life more enjoyable. And a musical talent or a sculpturing talent or a crafting talent, a decorating talent, whatever it is, is just that. It's a talent that God gives to people uh, from conception, not after they become a believer. It's not a spiritual gift, but it's something that God has given by his common grace um, to us. Now, I want to go back to those verses because I want to notice not only Jubal, but notice Zillah. Uh, he was the forger of instruments of bronze and iron. What that means is that God's common grace also involves industry, construction, invention, you know, how do gears work? Uh, being able to take a flowing stream of water and build a wheel that catches it and spins and then having gears inside and different uh, tools you can hook to that to grind grain or to sharpen in, uh, instruments uh, or uh, tools or whatever it is. Like, like all of that, you know, automobiles and air conditioning and, you know, all of us, every day have our lives impacted by industry, by construction and invention and development. Uh, and that's a part of God's common grace because that's bestowed on everyone. And not just believers drive cars and enjoy air conditioning. Uh, and so that's another element of God's uh, common grace. And then the last area of God's common grace is society. I'm not going to read all of Romans 13. It's fairly lengthy. Uh, but basically, we are told here that God instituted the government to... Uh, punish the wicked. So government is instituted by God, not for believers, but for everyone, for a nation, for society, and that a government is good, and that it has uh, uh, an element of common grace to it. It's good for everyone, whether you're believers or not believers, and there have been plenty of government officials over the years who claim to be Christians who are not good, and there are plenty who did not claim to be Christians, but were still very good at, at governing. That's a part of God's common grace. And I realize that, you know, all many of these things can be converted to evil. I realize there are evil governments. I realize that industry is sometimes used to create instruments of evil and death and destruction. And I don't just mean instruments of war, uh, but instruments of torture and, and uh, you know, those kind of things. Or that the, the, the making of industry has involved uh, child labor and, and things like that, or even slave labor in many places. I realize the arts can be used for pornographic purposes, um, and so all of those, but still the idea of these are that for all human beings, that's a part of God's common grace. So I want to give you three implications of common grace. The first one is that God is good, not just to believers, but God is good. Secondly, God can use non-believers to make our world a better place. Maybe one of the most obvious examples of this is Jonas Salk man who developed the polio vaccine, or at least developed the first polio vaccine. He was a Jewish man by race, but he was, uh, didn't practice religion, really didn't care for religion. Uh, so he was Jewish only uh, by racial identity, not by any kind of religious activity at all. And yet, God used this man who had no religious commitments of any kind, certainly was not a Christian uh, by any stretch, uh, used him to save millions of lives. And not only to save lives, but also to preserve many people who would have been handicapped as a result of polio. And so God uses unbelievers to make our world a better place. And that's okay. You can't say, well, I'm not going to take that vaccine because it was developed by an unbeliever. I'm not going to take that medication that was developed by an unbeliever. I'm not, we, we, don't, we don't work that way. We recognize that God, by common grace, even uses unbelievers to 
to improve our lives and to make the world, uh, like I said, a better place. And then a third implication um, is that uh, common grace can be misunderstood, particularly by non-believers, as being saving grace. Because God is good, because God's good to everyone, therefore everyone's going to go to heaven. The idea of universalism oftentimes is a result of an overemphasis on common grace without also equally emphasizing that we're not saved without saving grace. So God is good to everyone in common grace. He's good to his own in saving grace. Uh, And so even though you may experience common grace, that does not equal saving grace. And so we want to make sure to maintain um, that distinction. And lastly, common grace is necessary in our world for two reasons. One, without common grace, no one will become a Christian because everyone will be dead before we got there, (laughs) Uh, before we were able to make a commitment to Christ. So the fact that you can live long enough to become a believer is an aspect of common grace, uh, that God preserves your life even though you're a sinner. God doesn't snuff you out because of your sin early on. God preserves your life and sustains your life. Uh, And so, Uh, Without common grace, none of us would ever reach a point where we would be able to make a commitment to Jesus. And then uh, common grace uh, is necessary in our world because it is not saving grace. We need both of these. If the only kind of grace was saving grace, then yes, everybody would end up going to heaven. So common grace is necessary for God to pour out his goodness on his creation. But saving grace is necessary for God to pour out his salvation on those who come to Christ. And so both are necessary um, and both have their areas and we need to be careful not to distinguish between them. But as believers, we don't need to just think about God's saving grace. We also should be thankful for the common grace that God has shown to humanity uh, through the centuries and continues to show to us. As a matter of fact, every time you pray for a family member or a friend or somebody who goes to school with you or a coworker or whoever it is who is not a believer, You're thanking God for his common grace, that they're still alive and still have the opportunity to hear about the saving grace of our God who has been good to them by his common grace. So I hope that uh, you will remember as you view our world to thank God for both his saving grace and for his common grace. Hope you have a great day.